Hello, bonjour and ahoy. I'm Roger Hilton, Defense and Security Research Fellow at Globesec, coming to you live from the 2021 Globesec Bratislava Forum. It's day one, and it's my pleasure in the future for the next three days to be bringing you video highlights, recaps, and all of the major updates from our international conference. We have a rock star lineup of speakers and moderators, and we really hope you look forward to watching us in the future. We started bright and early with our annual European Defence Roundtable and launched Globesec's Future Security and Defence Council. Following the official welcome presented by our Masters of Ceremony, we heard a keynote from Slovakian President Susanna Čaputova on Building Back Better. We were then privileged to hear a video message from His Holiness, Pope Francis, who spoke to our world audience on the merits of hard work and compassion. Staying in Central and Eastern Europe, both the President of Poland and Croatia delivered keynotes and stressed the need for global solidarity in times of crisis. Shifting to a topic of the future, an energetic debate on the state of the future of transatlantic relations in the digital sphere took place. While on our second stage, the global perspectives on how to fight COVID and emerge from the pandemic stronger also happened. Finally, to wrap up the day, the Prime Ministers of Austria and Slovakia, as well as the Deputy Prime Minister of Czechia, discussed the European Recovery Plan and how to jumpstart the continental economy. For more information on our other world-class panels, make sure to check our website and our various social media channels on Facebook and Instagram. See you on day two. Good morning and thank you all for being here today. It's very exciting to attend a live event finally after being locked up for so long. We have a very exciting panel here this morning for you about a subject that I think is close to all of our hearts, the great EU soul searching. It's obviously something that we've been talking about for a very long time and I suspect will be for many years to come. But let me introduce the panel quickly. Um, we have some of the greatest experts on this subject in Europe here today, both in the room here as, as well as uh, virtually. Let me start uh, along with the appropriate protocol with our host, uh, Foreign Minister Ivan uh, Kwarchok. Thank you very much for being with us here today, sir. We also have Alexander Scharnberg, who of course is the Austrian foreign minister. We have piped in from Rome, Marina Sereni, who is the deputy foreign minister of Italy. And finally, we have Daniela Schwarza, who uh, many of you, I suspect, know from some of her previous jobs. She's in a new position now as executive director for Europe and Asia for the Open Society Foundation. And she is, as I am, based in Berlin. My name is Matthew Karnichnik. I'm Politico's chief Europe correspondent, and I have the pleasure of moderating the discussion today. I should mention that if you are interested in diving somewhat deeper into this material, the Globeset Policy Institute has published a paper called The Time for the EU's Pol Foreign Policy is Now, which you can uh, collect outside, I believe. I would also like to remind you that uh, you can ask questions. There's the Globesec app at your disposal, and I, I look forward to a, a lot of provocative questions from the audience over the next hour. Uh, let me just remind you that a session is only 60 minutes long, so uh, please keep your questions uh, brief, and I would ask the people in the room here to uh, stand up. So with no further ado, uh, let's begin, and I would like to start with you, Minister Scheinberg, if, if I could. Uh, you come from a country that is famous for being uh, neutral, some would say uh, maybe too neutral on, on some subjects. Um, when, when you are 
looking at this issue of uh, you know, the role that the EU should play on the global stage, I mean, especially today when we think about the summit meeting that is going to take place in Geneva in a few hours, uh, it's notable that the EU isn't going to be at that table. Should the EU have more of a role here? Will it ever be at the big boys table, as some people call it? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, for, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here, and it's really awesome, I have to say, to see so many people in, in 3D physically. Uh, um, uh, it makes a difference, and it, it's a good sign that we are slowly getting out of this uh, 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 situation we had in the last 12 months. Um, well, thank you for the question, because it's, it's funny. I have heard already the contrary, that Austria is not neutral enough uh, lately. Um, so uh, um, from our perspective, uh, in the last 25 years after joining the European Union, neutrality was never an issue. And I believe this is not the issue on the European level. And yes, we should claim our seat in the table of, of, of the big players. And, and we actually are sit we're already sitting there. Um, if we do the soul searching in Europe, we are extremely good at talking ourselves down sometimes. We have this tendency of seeing the deficiencies <laughs> and not looking at the things that are actually working. It's the same thing on common market and other European issues. We don't see the 80% working. We only stare at the 20%, which might be difficult. And we are still uh, the biggest worldwide donor of, of foreign aid. We are uh, uh, an economic block. We are a financial block. We are a trade block. We have leverage. The only thing is we have to start <laughs> using it. I believe the key word, the buzzword we should be using is less strategic autonomy, but coherence, capability to act and to put our pieces together. Because we have it, and I believe even and I, we have it constantly in the council, that we talk about issues and then we say, why don't we use our trade power? Why don't we? We are the biggest donor in a certain area. We are the biggest trade power in a certain area, but we are not capable of putting that, you know, spilling it over, bringing it over to use it as a political means. And this is something which is a hard lesson for Europe to learn. I believe the thing is, um, I, sometimes I compare it, if I can take a step back, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, we had this impression, everything, the whole world will become more European. Russia is moving towards us, Turkey is trying to take over European standards. Then we had a phase of hangover. We woke up and we found out, no, the world is not nice. The world is not moving and becoming towards the European Union. It's not becoming more European. And, and the winds are getting rougher for us. And now we are in this phase of waking up, of becoming, getting sober again and, and being more realistic. And it's a steep, main, sometimes painful learning curve, but we are doing it. Um, consider, for instance, the FDI screening we have established in 2000. Uh, 18, 19, foreign direct investments, or simply the wordings. I mean, that we consider in EU documents China as not only a partner and a competitor, but also as a systemic rival is something would have, we would have never done six to seven years ago. So things are progressing. We're not there yet, but Let's things are progressing. Let's follow up on that quickly, because you mentioned China. There was also an attempt over the past uh, several weeks to have a joint EU statement on China, um, criticizing China for the uh, human rights abuses there. That has been blocked by Hungary because we have this system of unanimity within the uh, EU 27. Uh, you talk about coherence, and yet it seems that still every country pretty much is pursuing its own uh, foreign policy. Your own country recently, I think you just hinted at the criticism of the neutrality, uh, which also happens to be my country, uh, raised the Israeli flag on the top of both the foreign ministry and the, uh, the chancellery a few weeks ago, uh, was criticized for that. So how do you create this coherence? Because it doesn't really seem uh, to be there at the moment. I don't believe that coherence has anything, anything to do with a qualified majority vote. Yes, I regret that we, we didn't manage managed to get a common approach and a common vote on, on, on Hong Kong. Um, but uh, I've been around for the Treaty of Nice negotiations. I've been part of most IGCs as, as diplomat in the, in the past uh, 20 years, um, even the Co Convention on the Future of Europe. Um, and uh, QMV is not the solution for everything. We have to be aware of that. Um, one of the strengths that the European Union has is this co internal capacity of speaking with one voice and this credibility that brings uh, that comes along with it. So in the moment we have QMV, probably third countries would, it wouldn't be a secret who voted against. 
So who would tell us that the Chinese or Russians or others would not use this possibility to go to the dissenting opinion and saying, come on, you don't agree, we can do something else. I believe, and here again, it's, it's less about procedural issues. It's about the political will. It's about this, uh, you could say, political culture in the council. And I hope we have the possibility to talk about it later on because I believe there are many things we can do. And I believe that the High Representative Josep Borrell is moving into the right direction, mandating ministers to do trips on, on his behalf and, and other things. And it's more the political will that we need than structural changes. And that is the, because coherence is the same thing. Um, if, we, if we start overcoming these blockages which we have, even within the Commission, that the DGA doesn't want to know what the DGB is doing or say, this is my garden, I, I tend to it alone. And we have the same thing on national level. This is not a criticism. This is a coherence, is a, is, is a challenge for every administration. And I believe if we get better at it, the, more, the stronger we will be internationally. Ivan Korchok, your country is also one of the smaller members of the EU. Uh, is not known to be a big fan of... We always UMP. say mid-sized countries. <laughs> 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 um, how do you achieve this goal of coherence, in your view, that uh, Minister Schallenberg just raised? Uh, I wish I knew. <laughs> but uh, funny thing is that uh, with my friend Alexander Schallenberg, by the way, who, who has a substantial contribution uh, to the fact that I'm foreign minister because, uh, because he offered me a repatriation flight, the last one from Washington, by which I managed to get home to be sworn in as a, as a foreign minister. So I got so since, many calls from Slovakia. Since then, <laughs> yes, not to do it. So, so from day one, we, we really became a very, very good colleagues. But I'm mentioning that as well, because when entering the room and, and uh, Mr. Kanichik, I encouraged him to start with, uh, with Alexander. And he said, well, it's difficult because always I speak after you, he said. And he always said, I agree with me. <laughs> and this time I want to make it a bit more provocative uh, because I am speaking after you. And I, I do not agree that much with. Uh, with what you said, because it's it's right that we as a European Union have um, capacities, that we have ambition, no doubt about it, to play a global role. Nevertheless, with, when you look at the output, I think it's it's not what it should be. I believe I am inspired by yesterday's contribution of our president. Uh, Zuzana Chabutova, what she said in, the, in her contribution, and, and partly by the Pope, Francis, who said that in a way that any soul searching, this is the title of the panel, start with recognizing reality in which we are living. And I have here four points where I believe, which I believe are worth recalling all the time in order to realize in what kind of world we are living in, in what kind of world the EU claims it's uh, its ambition to become a global player. What is underway is geopolitical shift from Euro-Atlantic to Indo-Pacific region, and that's not a theory. That's happening as we speak right now. Second, our model of governance is getting more and more under pressure, and I think John Allen, who was awarded yesterday, spoke eloquently about that. Liberal democracy gets under pressure. It's being questioned. It's being questioned not by our opponents, it's very often questioned by, by ourselves. Number three, the power struggle continues to move from traditional domain to competition in the area of technology. And the question is whether we can basically uh, live up oh, to, to, that, um, to that challenge and omnipresent issue of demography. So I think President Chaputo was right when she said we need a joint perception of this to see this reality and to set the ambition right for us, for European Union, to be a global player. That brings me to my second point, and that contradicts a little bit the doses of optimism which my friend brought today from Vienna. Friends, I'm a, the longer I'm in this business, uh, the, the more I'm asking myself whether we've set it right, our ambition to be a global player, a European Union. I'm not giving up that ambition, but I'm asking. Don't forget, the EU was created more than, what, 70 years ago, 
in order to basically not to project our interest externally beyond our borders, but rather to curb power within or amongst the member states. That was the original idea, the DNA on which the EU was built, to prevent countries you know, waging war amongst ourselves. But in the 60s and later on in the 70s, there was not a single idea that we would be expected to ex exert and, and, and uh, show power and project power externally. And all of a sudden, because the world has changed so much dramatically, of course there is no other way but to claim it. But if you look at the respective areas which influence the global developments, where are we? He is right, my friend Alexander, with the development policy and so on, uh, development assistance. Uh, that's right. But shouldn't we, instead of reclaiming the global ambition, start somehow rethinking the level of ambition that we want, that we want to project? And that brings me to the third point. I'm not a friend of grand strategies because, you know, every morning then you are waking up and you are confronted that while we have global ambition, while we have grand strategy, but you have Lukashenko. Right. And he, and he, and he exposes us to our level of influence where we basically see not only European Union, but other, other countries as well. Well, that, it, speaking about the countries, I'd like to bring in Deputy Minister um, Marini quickly. So, uh, but, but maybe the last point, just to r uh, round it up, I'm rather a friend of sub-strategies, a smaller, uh, clearly defined strategies vis-a-vis -vis, or in those areas where we must deliver. It's the Western Balkans, definitely. In the Middle East, where are we there as European Union? Where are we as European Union when it comes to solution of a conflict in Ukraine? Where are we in the north of, of Africa? So rather more down-to-earth approach in order not to be disappointed each, each and every time when we claim global, global uh, influence, but the output is suboptimal, I would say. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Marina Sereni, um, I'd like to bring you into the discussion. Uh, Ivan Korchok raises an interesting point that the EU, as it has evolved, is at a point now where it might be aiming too high and maybe it should stick to its knitting a little bit more and focus on <coughs> places in the world that it can change, be it the Western Balkans or looking at Belarus and other places. You represent one of the larger members of of the EU. Um, do you think from Rome, when you look out at Europe, that the European Union needs to be playing a more forceful role here? Um, or do you think that the system can continue to kind of muddle along as it is now? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And let me start thanking Mr. Korchok, Minister Korchok, for his kind invitation. I'm really glad to be able to participate in the Bratislava Forum, and I have to, the chance of analyzing with you a theme of central relevance of, uh, for our common future. Uh, the EU wants to be a global player, or in the expression used by both the President of the Commission and by the High Representative, a geopolitical actor. This is a huge challenge, and in my opinion it is also a necessity. It is quite clear that no single EU member state can have a real impact on major international issues while a European Union with a united position certainly will stand better changes. Uh, changes. Uh, the common foreign and security policy has the ambition to be the common foreign policy of 27 member states. Currently, however, it's, it is uh, often uh, uh, only the minimum common denominator of the 27 member states' foreign policies. This is the price we have to pay to have a common foreign policy reconciling national interests of 27 member states. These interests could diverge one from, from the other, and sometimes they could as well be in conflict one with the other. Uh, I am convinced that the EU should show in words and in deeds uh, its capacity to act as a geopolitical actor, especially in case of crisis, uh, like those mentioned by uh, Minister Korchok. 
especially in our own uh, yeah. neighborhood. I'm thinking as an example to the mid Mediterranean and Middle East area and specifically to the Middle East peace process. Recent events made it clear that this subject cannot be put aside, but needs to be faced and solved if we want peace and security for the region and indirectly for Europe. The European Union can play a significant role within the quarter and in contact with the parties, but it needs to show a coherent position, in other words, to speak with a single voice or with various voices if you want, but saying the same things. Uh, we are not there for the moment and we are losing or we, are, we risk to lose grounds, uh, ground to other actors. And we, we have to know this in the current situation in order to make sure that the EU acts collectively in foreign policy, it is important to make an effort to ensure the maximum convergence among member states. We should strive to have a common foreign and security policy at the same time effective and representative of the whole membership. Uh, there are in these new tools, uh, I, want, I, want, I would like to mention them, uh, through which the EU aims at improving its capacity to act in foreign and security policy. I'm thinking, for instance, at the new financial instrument for external action, DC, uh, DC, who is, uh, has been renominated Global Europe, uh, which should provide the EU geopolitical effort with a new operational architecture, able to better pursue its political priorities, including, including the promotion of democracy, the rule of law and human rights, security, migration and mobility, trade and inclusive and sustainable growth. Uh, in this year, we will also prove instrumental in helping us solving another of our problems. That is the need to increase EU visibility and projection capacity while countering a negative narrative on uh, our action abroad. Uh, equally, uh, I would like to mention the strategic compass, compass that EU is bringing together uh, the EU is bringing together in a coherent way all its security and defence tools. It is true, uh, Minister Korchok said before, uh, we, we should not think always in a strategic way for, every stra for having a strategy, but we need also uh, some places where we can think uh, strategically uh, and we need to have uh, we need, uh, we need to have these instruments. Uh, we need to have uh, the possibility to provide the EU with the ability to act autonomously when necessary, but together with others whenever possible. And the debate- Mr. Minister, just, just for a moment. We had, uh, we, we had in these days with the United States, we are uh, uh, with our principal allies, is uh, very uh, clear and very important for us. Thank you very much. And I do think that you raise an interesting uh, point, Danielle Schwarze, when uh, Deputy Minister Sereni talks about the lowest common denominator and uh, the uh, implication there is that there is a lowest common denominator. And in my view, there doesn't even seem to be a lowest common denominator. There is, there is no denominator often if you look at policy towards places like Russia or China recently. Uh, the Middle East, um, you know, is, is, is this really a realistic way forward uh, or should the EU just acknowledge that it doesn't have a common foreign policy and won't until it gets away with uh, QMV and maybe just concentrate on other things? Well, thanks for that encouraging question, Michael. <laughs> I, I, you know, I wouldn't agree with you. There is a common denominator. And if we just take the list that Ivan Korcha gave us of the challenges we are facing, I think if you start from there and you ask any European government um, whether the EU should be able 
to at least protect itself, if not impact on global developments that really go to the core of our national systems. Because the challenges that have been named, they, they are not out there. They are within the European Union. They are within member states. If you just take the topic of Chinese or Russian interference within Western liberal democracies. So I would say there is a common denominator. However, when we then look at the question do the member states share the answers to handle some of the crises? And you mentioned the Middle East. Um, we haven't talked about Africa yet. I would put that into the picture as well. Uh, Russia, of course. I think what we definitely need to work on in the European Union is a very precise risk and threat assess assessment. And of course, the attention of a country, for instance, like France, goes towards Africa, goes towards the risk of terrorism. While if you go to Poland and you ask them, what is your risk assessment? It is the physical threat of Russia. And it is the sense of undermining democracy within the European Union by hybrid threats. And so this is what the EU has to work on, and it has started. And this is what I find encouraging. And the deputy Italian foreign minister just said the strategic compass is an important tool for it. And I think it is true. What is this? Basically, the 27 member states compare notes on what they see out there as the most important threats and challenges. And the conversation that is now ongoing, and I suppose the ministers will, will be able to evaluate whether there is, in fact, progress in, in, uh, on the council level, there is a, an effort to build a common understanding. Um, and once we have that, we can be far more serious on the question of do we have the instruments? And I, you know, the term strategic autonomy uh, is very often mentioned. I don't think we should discuss that kind of abstract concept because Europeans don't project the same notions into that. What we need is a very serious understanding what capacity to act do we have and do we need. And if we look at that picture, it's grim because we do not have the tools at our disposal. Let me just comment on why I think this is so. Obviously, the member states never transferred foreign or defense policy to the European level. So you cannot blame the EU that it doesn't deliver on that. You have to look at the member states and you have to ask them, are you serious that individually you will be able to tackle those challenges out there? Is the right framework NATO or do Europeans need to work more closely together? And I do think if we take the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and the deep pressure on national budgets, there's an even stronger case now to enhance European cooperation on defense within the NATO framework. Um, let me pick one other example where it is really a lack of political will to build the right instruments. Um, we all know we live in a geo-economic world now where it's not only about foreign and defense policy, if we think about external relations and impacting regional or global developments, it's very much about the strategic use of economic tools as well, and others turn them against us. Now, we have the single market as a huge asset. We have the euro as a huge asset. But when we ask ourselves, is the euro punching above or below its weight internationally? The answer is clearly below. And why? Because it ha doesn't have the standing of an international currency. Now, I just, I'll close with that. When Donald Trump decided to leave the JCPOA, so the Iran agreement, we suddenly had this discussion in, in Berlin. I, you know, I was sort of part of it at the core. So what can we do? What alternatives do we have to, uh, you know, to um, counter the extraterritorial sanctions that the US imposed at the time. And the quick answer was, well, we have to use the euro. We need a stronger role for the euro. And then when it came to the discussion, why is the euro not where it should be? The simple answer is because the member governments never went as far as they should have to internally consolidate the monetary union by giving it a deep financial market, by giving it the financial tools it needs, by completing banking union, and by seriously working on legitimate governance mechanisms. So, you know, we can criticize the lack of global power of the EU, but in order to work on it, we have to look at the internal conditions within the European Union, and that's where the responsibility of national governments is.
Um, thank you very much. I think we've had uh, four very interesting opening statements here. I'd like to pick up the pace a little bit with, with your questions. Uh, we, we do have a few questions already. One to the heart of what you were just saying, uh, Daniela, which is the, the question of the EU's uh, defense capability and if that needs to be built out really before something substantial can happen in terms of EU power. Ivan Korchok, uh, your country is a member of NATO. Um, how, how do you see this question? I mean, are, are, do, do we need to get to a point where um, there, there really is a, a substantial EU military force in some, in, in some constellation for the EU to exercise its power in addition to the economic tools uh, through the euro and, and, and other measures? <clears throat> NATO is uh, in a good shape. I think it's, it's fair to say, and uh, this is my conclusion from the meeting which I had a chance to attend um, two days ago. Um, I, have, um, I have a good feeling from that. Uh, it's a recommitment to the very basic role of NATO, which is collective defense. Uh, we have an agreement that we have embarked upon a journey where we want to make it fit for the 2030 challenges. America is back. President Biden was very uh, clear and um, outspoken on that. So NATO is, a, I think, in a good shape. In addition, this is not very popular, but over the last four years, the, the member states of NATO have, have increased the defense spending by 200 billion. 200 billion more are we spending as a NATO nations for our own defense. Now, the, the eternal question about defense and that ambition of European Union in, in that area, PESCO, fine. Ambition, fine. But the capability issue, well, I think we are lagging behind the ambition again. But still, when it, when it comes to what we can project here in this area, it's a question of political will, whether, whether we are able to go into common operation, operations in, in our vicinity. I'm very much uh, curious what the European Union wish, will show in, in Africa, in, in, uh, in uh, Sahel uh, region. Um, so this is, uh, this is extremely important if we really want to live up to what we proclaim our, our global, global ambition and more influence in the area of foreign policy. Let, let me go to uh, Mr. Scharenberg quickly, because you have an interesting perspective, I think, coming from, again, a, a neutral country. No, actually, uh, I think actually, it might be good that you're not in yeah. NATO, actually, because uh, no. the Austrian Bundeswehr, I think, spends uh, less, well less than uh, no, no, I, I don't believe I don't believe it's anything to do with being non-aligned and, and neutral. Um, the, the two points. One is, uh, and, and you said there's something very important, is, is the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a little bit old school to think now we need a European army and this would be the, 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 the safety we have in the future. Um, if we take the risk assessments nowadays, it's about things like new technologies, artificial intelligence and these things. So, uh, um, uh, or, or, or quantum mechanics. If we don't get our act together on that, it's no use to have an army, frankly. Uh, so I believe we first we need a risk, risk assessment because otherwise we do what we are great in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we make a grand statement, we have great speeches, we make one step but without taking the second step, and we have something where we can have a, an opening ceremony, and nothing follows. I believe uh, um, on on uh, defence policy, something, and this has nothing to do with neutrality. Again, we never had an issue with that, and we said so when we joined. And we have five member states being non-aligned. It's not only Austria; it's Ireland, Malta, Sweden, and Finland. So. Um, what about pooling and sharing? Why don't we have a common market in the defense area? We have tried, and it didn't fail because of the five countries which are non-aligned. It failed of those, uh, because of those countries who have a defense industry, and we're under pressure from the local def national defense industry definitely not to buy uh, uh, the, with the neighbor, you know, to buy the national product. So why don't we start with that, what we're good at, creating 
the rules, implic uh, applying the rules of the common market in this area. That would be a first step. And then we can take the second one. So instead of having, again, a grand design and, and uh, only doing it halfway, as we did in other areas like Schengen, for instance, we did the first step without taking the second step, or the euro area. Um, so I believe uh, let's make a risk assessment first, see where we need to put our strength together uh, or pool our forces. And I believe that we might end up saying it's not uh, you know, the hardware and the army stuff. Um, thank you very much. I would like to go to the questions in the room, so please prepare your questions, and, and while you're thinking about them, uh, I'd like to take one of the questions from the Globesec app, which I think is right to the uh, wheelhouse of our, our panelists up here. It has to do with the Western Balkans, and um, the, the, the question is, to what extent do you feel the EU is making progress in the Western Balkans in terms of advancing the EU's geostrategic uh, objectives. As said previously, if there is a place where the EU could make its weight felt, uh, it would be in the Western Balkans, maybe start small. Uh, I think, um, Ivan Korchok, you probably have some thoughts on this. <laughs> yes. No, I, I mean, the Western Balkans, where else if not there? And this is, this is my doctrine, my thinking, if you want. Uh, if you want to claim global ambition, you have to start in your neighborhood, in your vicinity. So it's a must. Uh, there we have to project uh, our interests because they are, they are indicated that they want to be members uh, one day. Yet at the same time, we see that that's still in the, in the European Union, um, national interests are prevailing and we Next week, actually, we, we can show in the Council whether we can finally open or move forward uh, the accession talks with two countries, with Albania and North, uh, North Macedonia. If not, then we ourselves are putting our, our uh, enlargement policy, which we believe is the main instrument of uh, projecting stability in, in doubt and in, in, in question. Um, Everybody sees that, that there are competing powers which are projecting their interest uh, in, in the Western uh, Balkans. It's a, it's a must uh, for us. But once again, this is, this is where we can basically measure that on the one hand, we want to be a player there. On the other hand, when it comes to such a fundamental issues, like to reciprocate to the progress that North Macedonia and Albania have done, we are not able to find a consensus because there is one national issue, which I do respect, I want to say. I do respect that Bulgaria has a national interest there. But if you look at, at it from, from a broader perspective, it, it is a big problem for us. And then I'm asking myself, you know, how can we expect that we will be, we'll be more able on a big chess uh, game when we are not able to to have a clear position in the in the Western Western Balkans. I couldn't um, agree I would like more. To take we a, can stop yeah. talking about yeah. geopolitics. It's, it's, our, it's not even our neighborhood. It's, our, it's a European courtyard. It's, courtyard. it's surrounded by EU member states. It's like our patio, you know, and we don't get the act together in our neighborhood, then we should stop talking about the grand designs in geopolitics. It's as simple as that. Sorry to be very frank. Uh, citizens expect us to be able to project security. And, and uh, uh, Commissioner Johan once said very rightly, either we are capable of projecting and exporting security and stability or we'll end up importing instability and insecurity. It's a very simple quotation. And, and um, it's, it's astonishing that we fail even in the closest neighborhood. You mentioned Belarus beforehand. We have the Ukraine, we have Moldova, we have Southern Caucasus, we have the Northern uh, uh, the southern Mediterranean, and the whole these, are, Eastern these are the areas where area. we have to prove ourselves. Yeah. I would like to go to a question in the room. Uh, the woman here in the second row, please uh, state your name and your affiliation, please. Isadora Subillaga. I am a democratic activist from Venezuela, and for the last two years I've been the Vice <coughs> Minister for Foreign Affairs of the constitutionally elected interim government. I want to first thank Vice Minister Marina Sereni because she has been a great champion for the Venezuelan cause in Italy. But I am uh, actually surprised and sad that I've been here for two days and nobody has mentioned the word Latin America. It's like we don't exist. Um, and the EU, the EU 
we believe and we feel that sometimes have disconnects between Brussels and the member states, disconnects between Brussels and the EU Parliament, who has a more firm and clear uh, view of what happens uh, in Venezuela and Latin America, because do, what do it's you have a question though? Uh, yes. Okay. It's uh, having a spillover effect over the rest of the region. My question to you both in the room and to, to, to all of you um, is don't take Venezuela geographically or culturally because what you have experienced and the diagnosis that you have here from the real threat that we have in Latin America is more important because it's based on values. We're defending democracy and the threat comes from countries like Russia, like China, like Iran. And it seems to me that you can take a greater stand defending these values in a region that it's actually close to Europe. Thank you. Th th thank you very much. Let's uh, try to make the uh, answer briefer than the uh, questions, please. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Sereni, would you like to take this question since you seem to uh, have some expertise in Latin America? Yeah, I want to, I want to greet my friend Isabella. And uh, yes, I, I agree with her. Uh, of course, Europe has uh, to take into account the perception of our security and our uh, main priorities uh, uh, in, this, in this moment in the agenda is not Latin America, but at the same time, uh, as we want to be a global player, we cannot uh, forget the Latin America because we have uh, a very strong cultural, economic uh, and political relationships uh, with that uh, region. Uh, particularly, we have to be committed in a crisis a situation like uh, uh, that one in Venezuela, because there is, we are facing a huge humanitarian crisis uh, and we need to show, together with other partners like Mandid, uh, like uh, US, of course, uh, we have to show that we are uh, helping uh, the opposition and the population not only on the humanitarian side, but also on the political one. Uh, and we are following, uh, as EU, uh, the process for the next elections in November. Uh, well, you, you know that there are some, uh, some very small uh, pieces of hopes uh, that we can see in the dialogue. Uh, we are following the Norwegian uh, activities of mediation. And we are pushing for a real dialogue for all, uh, among uh, the Venezuelans with the uh, uh, guarantee of the international community. Uh, we will participate uh, next uh, uh, tomorrow uh, to the donors conference about Venezuela, but it is not enough to be there with the humanitarian uh, uh, attitude. We have also to uh, have a political one. Minister Serena, I'd like to bring in uh, the other panelists here. Alexander Scharnberg, yeah. you, you had a, a brief comment, as did Ivan Kotchak. We only have 15 minutes yeah. left, so I'd o like to... Only a very brief move, comment. Yeah. Don't take it personally. Uh, um, probably other regions weren't mentioned as well. But uh, you uh, raised a point which I think is pre extremely important we haven't mentioned either yet. Um, I believe one of the key issues is for the European foreign policy in the future is it has to be a value-based foreign policy. This is our strength. This is our exactly. soft power. And we have to acknowledge only 25% of UN member states are sharing the same model of life. And if we talk about the Western Balkans, for instance, or Venezuela, it's a fight about what kind of model we want to export. And I believe very strongly and personally, our, the things we fought for, the things we build up, uh, in the last two and a half centuries, actually, in Europe, are universal, are of a universal value, and we should fight for them. So we need a value-based foreign policy. We need to invest in those partnerships that are necessary, like the transatlantic partnership, like the UK. Let's forget about Brexit. Let's move on with UK, because it's a strong partner we need in the future. And, and on this respect, you may raise an important point, because it doesn't make a difference whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's in Nepal, or whether it's in Southeastern Asia, or in Hong Kong. Um, I believe this this is one, a very strong point, and thank you for, for opening the possibility. Ivan just, a, just a technical remark. Um, have, you, have you noticed that one of the first decisions that I have made as a, you know, within, the, within the government for which I was severely criticized here in this country that we've recognized, uh, interim president uh, Guaido, and then more sarcastically I say, 
I wish we had such a unified position as European Union as we have on Venezuela and in other issues. Uh, you know, uh, so I believe it's. Um, of course, we cannot influence entirely the internal developments there, but we've been dealing with Venezuela quite extensively, and the position is uh, is very clear um, towards that. Uh, very, very good point, sir. Thank you, uh, Daniela. Uh, you wanted to say something briefly? Yes, I'll be very short, and it adds to uh, what Minister Schallenberg just has said. So, credibility starts at home, and I think if you know if that is right, what you said, and I deeply buy into that, we should have a values-based foreign policy. We can see how our internal problems of actually protecting those Western liberal values mm -hmm. is harming our ability to project soft power. And I guess the Western Balkans are one example where this may play out because there's competition. There's competition there between two systems. And we need to make sure that we maintain this credibility by ensuring that we do not see further democratic backsliding within the European Union. And the second that's a point of sense of urgency I wish to add is Yes, we have to focus on the regional crisis around the EU and on those countries who are waiting for our leadership to help them transition further, yes. However, we cannot shy away from the very global dimension that was in your question, and that, that is the systemic competition piece. And yes, we have to rebuild transatlantic relations in that regard, but my concern at the moment is that the EU and a number of member states, and I include my own, um, Germany is too slow in actually seizing that momentum that is right now being offered by the United States under new leadership. So if we want to do what you said, I think we have to act on both accounts far more decidedly. I believe you're completely right, but I, I have to say one thing, a caution. Um, yes, we have to remain credible, but we should not, we have to see the other side because we should not fall into the trap to buy in the narrative of other countries who, for instance, tell the, 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 the Americans, who tell President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken, you don't have nothing to teach us because you have faults in the US as well on human rights. So stop telling us what to do because that's an mm -hmm. internal affair. No. So there is still a huge difference and a gap between our standards and the struggle we have internally within the European Union and the fight we are, we are having in, in, in other countries and areas of this world. And yes, um, I 100% agree with you. Um, we have this, and I believe it's, time is of the essence, we have this chance now to really mend, come together, make the North Atlantic, if you want so, more narrow. And we should not mess it up with Europe. America needs us now, and now uh, watching what we're doing. And if we are sending the right signal, and we did already send a couple of right, uh, wrong signals, um, then, then we shouldn't you know, be astonished if in a couple of years there will be payback time again. And I believe from my perspective, and we should stop, please stop talking about the transatlantic relationship. Let's talk, let's talk with Americans about Libya, about mm -hmm. the Middle East, about uh, sub-Saharan Africa, about concrete issues where we say, what do we do together? How do we proceed with sanctions? What can we do on a regular level? Instead of s talking in like a partnership, you know, um, how are you doing? Uh, what should we do better? Shall we have an excursion together? No. This is not partner therapy. We should act together. Um, and no, but sometimes, sorry, I'm very adamant and very emotional no. on this issue because no. it's, it's, I believe it's once in a lifetime. And I have this feeling in the Biden administration to see, I've never seen an administration which has so much the wish and the will to work together with us. And, and here again, neutrality has nothing to do with it. It's values. <laughs> Sorry to come right. back to this issue all the time. But it, it's about values. And, and my policies, I want my grandchildren to wake up in a, in, a, in a society where they have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of media. And our partner in that, the most important partner, are the U.S. And we have to see this. And the, I believe in the next 30, 40 years, it will be a really daunting and challenging struggle we will have ahead of us and I believe it's worth fighting for it. Thank you very much. I would like to go to another question from the right. audience. No, no, there was no, no. a gentleman I, here in the I, third I, row who'd had his hand up uh, for a while. And, uh, <sighs> Milan Nietzsche, I'm with German Council of Foreign Relations in Berlin but originally from Globsec and Bratislava. I want to ask about vetoes in EU foreign policy. How can you reconcile it with the EU capacity to act that you mentioned, Daniela? Uh, there is increasing nervousness in Berlin with Hungarian vetoes, but what can actually be done about it? What can new federal government in Germany be able to do if you want to change the treaties? And second question to Minister Schallenberg, if I may. It's really a refreshment to see a more Austrian participation at Globsec 
Um, but your, your chancellor I yesterday, wasn't invited before. <laughs> I can tell you, as I'm a veteran here, that we always tried. Okay. There is a change on the Austrian side, which is welcome. I wasn't minister. <laughs> Milan, there are two Austrians on the panel now, so you can't complain. <laughs> Might include it. But it's about values. It's also about how you define your neighborhood and your partners in the EU. And your chancellor yesterday was really brilliant very eloquent, but he also slipped something. He, when he referred to Central Europe, then he turned to his colleagues from Czech Republic, Slovakia, and then said Eastern Europe. So how can you reconcile your <laughs> increased presence, not only at Globsec, but in the region, when you still use the old perceptions and call your partners Eastern Europeans when you travel 60 kilometers down the Danube from Vienna? <laughs> oh, that's a provocative question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let you take that quickly. And then... Okay. Uh, um... Maybe, maybe we, we start considering ourselves as Eastern Europe. We are East from Prague, actually. <laughs> no, I, I talk about uh, Central Europe. And uh, actually, it's funny that we don't have an expression, actually, for the other partners in the European Union. We continue, and that's a very dangerous thing. It's another debate not to be uh, conducted today, is this group perception, the, the club of 2004 and 7 or whatever, whatever, the new member states, which is ridiculous because they're not new anymore. And yes, we're investing in a, 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 a heavily in this part partnership, because I think the one thing, and, and, and the pandemic was not only bad, there were messages in there, there were lessons we were, we were taught, like the urge of digitalization, the push in, in foreign policy, that's another important issue, and I hope that we won't, you know, get it all rid of uh, uh, once, once the pandemic is fully over. And the other one was neighborhood matters. If you have a fire in your apartment, you don't run to the guy on the other side of the city, you run to the next door neighbor. And that was the thing here. And there's something I believe, sorry, it sounds romantic, beautiful, which has developed, is uh, we had Slavkov, we have Central 5, we have all these formats, and we always have so much to discuss about. Uh, um, so I wouldn't pin it down to words uh, and for me, it's, it's, it's clearly Central, Central Europe, and we consider ourselves as part of this. This is a wider region starting somewhere in, in northern Italy and, and Switzerland and, and moving at least until Lemberg, I would say, um, which is, by the way, closer to Vienna, that's the Ukrainian border, than Vorarlberg. Uh, just to play, place, you, place us uh, geopolitically. But I believe the G QMV question, I believe we all could do, was addressed <laughs> to you. Um, shall I take it? Yes, please. Yeah. So, Milan, you know, one, one question is, can we get it? And you mentioned the German government, which makes me slightly smile, because Germany held the EU presidency uh, last year. And at some point, QMV was on the agenda as an idea. And you can blame many things on COVID, but not the fact that this didn't move forward. So what I'm trying to say is you need unanimity to introduce qualified majority votes. And if there's always one or two countries who do not you know, want to go with the EU consensus, there's a very small likelihood that this will actually happen. You know, right now I hear the discussion is, and maybe Ivan Kocho can say more on that, to, to start in some areas of foreign foreign affairs where it is less, let me say, less political, less painful to be able to create the ability to move forward more quickly, like maybe stabilization policy, crisis support, things like that, humanitarian issues. That would be a big step forward. But for the geostrategic questions that we have been discussing here, if we even had qualified majority vote in the Council of Ministers, I believe the very contentious issues would move up to the European Council, where unanimity again plays. So what I do believe is that the efforts that we have described in trying to frame the issues in, this, in a way that Europeans can slowly but surely understand, and not only the top-level political leadership, but really the public debate, can understand that we have a common interest to defend and a common shared not model that we really work very well with to defend. Um, I think this is the base. And then those more mechanical questions of uh, change of voting rules can then come. And while we have to do that, I think we will see, and I hope we will, uh, member states starting initiatives in smaller groups, but ensuring the backing of at least a vast majority of European governments. And then one final point, which I think was already mentioned, uh, a tool that Josep Borrell wants to employ increasingly is to have special envoys for certain issues and certain regions who can give a voice to the European Union without, of course, at this point, a formal vote, but who can be 
and show a European presence in areas where the EU is not perceived as a major player. Um, so I think that's what we have to work on for the moment. Of course, I would prefer a system where decisions go through smoothly and are then acceptable to those who are in the minority, but I don't think we are there at the moment. So we have to work with those other means. And again, national governments still have a huge responsibility in that system. Thank you very much, Daniela. Ivan Korchok, you wanted to make a brief comment on this before we get to yes, the next question. We only on, have a few minutes on QMV, left. On it, it slowly becomes yet another mantra, the question QMV, yes or no, it slowly becomes yet another mantra of which we believe once we resolve it, then we are saved. Mm -hmm. mm. That, that will not happen. Exactly. Uh, my problem is that I've been, I spent too much time working within the EU and I'm asking the audience because there's so many experts. What do we want to, um, what do we want to decide on by QMV within the council? which does not legislate. FAC is not adopting legislation in most mm -hmm. cases. There is maybe one area with the, with the sanctions where we we'll legislate, but in other councils, you know, internal market, well, the, the entire area of internal market, it's QMV, but it's legislation. Mm -hmm. The way how we are trying to project our interests in foreign affairs, it's not through legislation. It's political positions. In other council formations, I don't want to bother you too much with that, there is unanimity as well when adopting political, uh, political statements. So I would be very cautious uh, you know, in, in trying to portray a situation that once we introduce QMV, and I'm asking the audience, QMV on what in foreign policy? I think, or I Middle think, East, or, or I other think Marina positions. would like to jump That's in. That's going to be more, much, much more uh, complicated, and it seems to become a solution to our inability to, you know, have a more, more impact in, in foreign policy. Thank you, uh, Marina Serini. I think you had Sorry a comment spoil, on this. Spoil the game. Yes, I need briefly a short comment because uh, I agree uh, uh, qualified majority voting should not be a mantra, but we cannot avoid to have it uh, in our discussion because we need a decision-making process compatible with modern reaction and communication times. Uh, we, we are not legislating, but if we have to, to take a position we have to do it in a normal time uh, with the communication time. And the, the debate on the, at the EU level about uh, QMV uh, in common foreign policy should, uh, will be complicated and long. Uh, we certainly need to proceed cautiously uh, and with an incremental uh, approach. Uh, I agree with Daniela, it's not necessary to have uh, a decision immediately on this, but we have to promote a process uh, since uh, we all know that uh, those in some fields uh, that are particularly sensitive, we need to, to try to find the way ahead. Uh, and uh, I think we cannot avoid this discussion, uh, not to decide immediately, but to have a process. Should we? Should, uh, sorry. Just, sorry. Yeah. Should we? We just have a couple of minutes. We, should we give a green light to starting negotiations with Albania and, and Macedonia via QMV? Well, we can we can we can ask the audience. I did want to take one more. Not, <laughs> but 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 that's impossible. Uh, at this moment, because Mr. it's not a legislative decision, Minister it's a political Korshaw, decision. I, I think so, we, we have somebody who might have some very interesting thoughts on this. One more question from to uh, follow Milan's advice and keep it in the, in the Habsburg lands. Um, <laughs> Karl Schwarzenberg, I believe you had a, a question and maybe a, a comment on some of these issues. Karl Schwarzenberg put an interesting question. If our aim is oh, too high, but I ask myself, considering the European Union, after all, sometimes taking part in foreign policy in the European Union, do we have any aims in in European Union? Do we have any clear aims in foreign policy? I didn't recognize them during the whole years I was active in policy. We don't have clear program. Have you, uh, from any commission or from oh, this new invented Office of uh, Foreign Relations, uh, member of the commission, heard?
clear program. What is our aim in the Middle East? What is our aim towards Russia? What is our aim towards the United States, Latin America, and so on? We have mild interests, softly spoken, nothing more. We don't have any aims. I mean, it's not that I prefer the 19th century, but there was mention Venezuela. In 19th century, one country alone, Britain or France, okay. If there were problems, send Sir, just briefly, because we're running out of time. And the interests were clearly defined. Nowadays, we have two or three clear words, and that's all. Thank you very much. I think, Thank you, sir. I think um, we have. But first, Minister Schaunberg, uh, just a, a quick uh, yeah. comment v on this. Very briefly, um, aim. If you ask Germany, France, what is your aim on Russia? What is your aim? I believe if we go on the, if we go on the meta uh, level, we have an aim, and I believe that's what I tried to say at the very beginning, that we are waking up, we are sobering up, we're becoming less naive in, in Europe. And my, and for as far as I'm considered, the aim is safeguard our values and, and export them if possible, but we are in a competition as far as our model of life is concerned. And we are really realizing that this is a not kind surroundings. We, are not, we would love to have only friends, and we are figuring out now that we don't, and that we have actually very few trusted valuable friends, and this is, I believe, the aim. What this means then when you put it on Russia, on Belarus, on the Middle East, on Israel and so on, that's something which might change from year to year, it changes to the situation, but I believe I have, that we have a very clear aim as far as values are concerned, I would say. At least I have. 100% agreement, this is what I wanted to say. Very good. I mean, I mean no, the, the question whether we have aims in, in foreign policy is legitimate, but it's, it's put narrowly, because the overarching aim of European Union is to protect the model of governance, which now gets into competition globally. I think that's the overarching. And foreign policy should just contribute to achieving that aim. But that aim is clearly defined, I think it's Article 2, I don't know which one of the, of the treaty, but this is how to protect globally the model of governance which made us prosperous and safe for many, many decades. That's the Slovak interest in the European Union. That's a very good final word, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the panelists for an engaging discussion. Thank you to the audience. I'd like to remind you that the next session here in Maria Theresia will be in five minutes. Uh, so you don't have much time where we'll be discussing what needs to happen to create an EU that really delivers following up on this discussion. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry.